This session is on fetal monitoring in labour. Um, if you have a prompt manual, you'll find most of the information that we cover in, these, in this presentation is included in module five in the prompt course manual. So first off, I'm just gonna cover some of the national and international guidance and also recent publications. Um, in 2017, there was the NICE Intrapartum Care Guidelines, um, and those are the current guidelines that we are using um, in our units. Um, more recently, um, NICE have released um, an Intrapartum Care Guideline for women with medical conditions, um, and this has specific guidance on the form of fetal monitoring for women with these conditions, and there's a whole range of um, conditions such as heart disease, asthma, and acute kidney injury. Okay, so now we'll just cover some of the more recent publications. Um, and in 2017, the infant trial results were published. Um, the trial was looking at comparing computerized CTG systems with humans to see if there was improved outcomes. And in fact, the findings um, were that there was no demonstrated improvements by having the computerized system. Embrace, um, they released a confidential inquiry in 2017 um, and it was specifically about intrapartum stillbirths and intrapartum related deaths at term. Um, the key findings were that there was a frequency for intermittent auscultation to not be compliant with national guidance. Um, continuous electronic fetal monitoring wasn't commenced um, when there were concerns with intermittent auscultation. Um, there often wasn't an hourly review um, there were delays with referral to medical staff um, and that was occurring in about half the cases and there was evidence of lack of situational awareness, so not taking the whole picture into consideration. A more recent publication came out in May 2020, the ESME Confidential Inquiry, and that was specifically looking at birth centres um, and midwife-led centres. Um, and this found very similar findings to what had been found in the EMBRACE report um, and they had some recommendations that included routine audit um, of the frequency of fetal monitoring because this hadn't been done well in the cases that they looked at um, and certainly when a woman is transferred for obstetric care there should be an instant prompt obstetric review so they were the key recommendations. When we're looking at what intrapartum factors we think are important for predicting fetal compromise. There was a paper that came out by Asma Khalil um, and that recommends that there's key things that you can identify that would be important for indicating hypoxia and these are four main factors. Small babies, um, significant meconium stained liquor, intrapartum maternal pyro pyrexia and a failure to progress in labour. So those are key factors that were found to influence um, babies' admissions to NICU. The Saving Babies Lives Care Bundle 2 has a module on fetal monitoring labour and recommends certain um, competency testing to ensure that staff are competent with um, managing fetal monitoring in labour um, and we have a separate module about that. So now we're going on to fetal monitoring in labour and a little bit of basic fetal physiology, just a few slides. So the aims of fetal heart rate monitoring in labour, what are we trying to um, achieve? So we want to avoid fetal injury by identifying signs of hypoxia early before we can lead to long-term damage. Um, if you look at the analysis of, of RCTs that have been run looking at electronic fetal monitoring and intermittent auscultation, they show that neither method is particularly reliable on their own, um, but they, um, there's mainly because there's no reliable way to determine the fetal reserves. But other factors such as clinical context and human factors of course affect outcome, meaning that you've got to consider all of these factors. Before you undertake any fetal monitoring labour, it's really important to do a risk assessment, look at the whole clinical picture, um, so that you can consider any maternal and fetal conditions that may be affecting how well that baby is going to cope with labour. Um, it's essential that you take a full maternal history, you perform a full physical assessment at the start of labour, and then based on that risk assessment, you'll recommend the method of monitoring um, that will be at the start of labour. Of course, you constantly risk assess through labour in case that risk level changes and you need to change your method of monitoring. 
So thinking of our basic physiology, um, a fetus in utero is designed to cope with labour, um, but remembering that basic physiology can help you to under, understand why some babies might not cope. Um, it also helps with deciding your escalation and action um, when there are concerns with the fetal heart rate, um, and that might either be intermittent auscultation or as looking at your CTG. Um, as we said many times already, it's vital to consider the whole clinical picture when you're deciding your actions. Um, if we think of very basic things like the gaseous exchange at the placenta, obviously um, that's where the oxygen is, give, is taken to the baby and where the carbon dioxide is taken away. Um, you need a good placenta for this to happen um, and of course, when you have contractions, you've got a restriction in that blood flow during the contraction. But of course, once the contraction goes, then hopefully there's enough time for that baby to recover before the next contraction starts. So all of this works well, as long as you've got sufficient time between your contractions for the baby to recover from the um, restriction. Um, there's a healthy placenta. Uh, you haven't got a cord that's occluded in any way and you haven't got a hypertensive mother. This slide is about the factors that influence fetal oxygenation and there are some conditions and events that affect the mother or the placenta or the fetus um, and may cause hypoxia. If you're looking at fetal lactate levels this is an indicator of how well the fetus is coping with the hypoxia. So initially lactate levels in the fetal blood are sort of neutralized and there's a, a length of time where the baby can cope with a, a degree of hypoxia. Eventually the fetus becomes um, more acidotic and the pH measurement is done by doing a fetal blood sample. With continued use of their glycogen stores, so these are the stores of glucose that they use to try and cope with this lack of oxygen, um, there's a further decrease in the blood pH, so the baby can, becomes more and more acidotic. They can compensate to a degree for a period of time, and of course you can imagine that compensatory response is um, if you've got a well-grown baby and a well-grown placenta, that will be better than your small baby. Um, but over time, even the healthiest, nicely grown baby will be overwhelmed and the risks of asphyxia are increased. This slide is looking at um, the fetal heart rate response to reduced oxygen levels. And if you look, you'll notice that these are the key features that we look for when we're describing a CTG. So you may have increases in the fetal heart rate because of reduced oxygen. You may have a reduced baseline variability, which happens over time. Ideally, you want to see accelerations, but these might disappear as the baby tries to conserve energy by not moving. Um, you may start to see decelerations and these may become more frequent as the hypoxia increases. You may have an acute bradycardia um, and this is where the fetal pH can drop quite dramatically very quickly, 0.01 every minute. Okay, so local guidelines. Now, very important that you're familiar with your local guidelines and you're familiar with your documentation aids. Um, if you have stickers um, that aid your, not only your interpretation, but they might also aid your escalation and your action plans, then these should be used in your unit, okay? Um, and it's not just about looking at the CTG, it's looking about the clinical factors, so you need to take those into account. And also it's about the vital importance of communi communicating to your colleagues um, when you feel there's a problem. We've mentioned about risk assessment before, we've mentioned how important that is at the start of labour and as you continue through labour, and that's whether you're going to do intermittent auscultation or whether you're going to do electronic fetal monitoring. You need to risk assess to see which is the most appropriate method of monitoring. So if you're going to do intermittent auscultation, we mentioned earlier about the EMBRACE report and how it um, looked at the intrapartum related um, deaths and the issues that it raised were a failure to recognise when it, labour was established. So sometimes the fetal monitoring and the intermittent auscultation wasn't started till well into the labour and maybe you've missed a significant period of the labour where actually you should have been listening in. Um, there was also um, issues with how frequently it's done. We have set um, guidance on how frequently you should do it in the first and the second stage and this should be documented as well. 
Um, I mentioned about the ESME confidential inquiry, which was specifically for um, low risk settings. Um, and again, it flagged up the incorrect frequency documented of how they were doing intermittent auscultation um, and also confusing on the partogram how it was documented. So again, these are issues that we should all look at locally. This is just uh, looks very complex. There's a long list there of things that you need to risk assess for when a woman comes in in labour. Um, and if you find there aren't any risk factors, then you can recommend and offer intermittent auscultation. However, if there are risk factors, then you would offer the woman electronic fetal monitoring. Um, and of course, it's her choice at the end of the day what she will choose. If you're Using intermittent auscultation, then the set guidelines are that you need to leave, listen for at least 60 seconds. You need to start listening towards the end of the contraction when it's comfortable for mum, that's the FIGO guidance, or immediately after the contraction is what NICE recommend. Um, the idea is that you're listening at the crucial time when you might hear that that baby hasn't coped well with the contraction. You need to do it every 15 minutes in the first stage and you need to do it every five minutes in the second stage. And that's from the time you diagnose second stage, not from the time that we think she's starting actively pushing, it's for the entire second stage. And you need to clearly document those um, recordings on your partogram. This is a sticker that you might use for intermittent auscultation and an hourly risk assessment. If you have a different sticker in your unit then you must use your sticker. Very important though that you are documenting hourly not only the fetal heart rate and what it was at the start of labour but also some clinical information to make sure that you're considering the whole clinical picture in your hourly risk assessment. Um, this is just a summary table saying about the concerns that you might have. You're looking at the fetal heart rate, um, you're looking at whether there's a presence of fetal movements and these are things that you document. And they are also noting the frequency of the contractions because if they're too frequent, this could cause problems with your fetal heart rate. Okay, going on to electronic fetal heart rate monitoring. This requires a, con a combination of continuous risk assessment um, of the clinical picture, a recognition if there's any changes in the fetal heart rate, and then documentation of all of these features. And that's usually via a sticker or whatever you use in your itch unit. Very importantly, it's not only about documenting those things, it's about making clear that there's an action plan and that you're escalating um, to the correct um, seniority of staff. If you're looking at the normal CTG, nothing we like more than to see a normal CTG. Um, and we're looking at five features. We're looking at the baseline rate, we're looking at the variability, uh, whether accelerations are present. Ideally, we don't want to see any decelerations, but for a period of time, they may be acceptable. Um, and of course, we're looking at the bottom line as well, the contractions, because if the contractions are too frequent, that might cause the fetus to not cope with labour. But of course, we're looking at this in context with our clinical circumstances. Um, and I guess we can always say that when a CTG is classified as normal, it's likely that the fetus is coping well with labour, so we can be reassured by that. This is the prompt sticker for documenting our hourly risk assessment. It's asking about the, fe uh, the fetal heart rate and the features that we've just described, but it's also taking in some clinical information about progress in labour, um, the colour of the light core, um, mother's maternal pulse rate, and importantly, the gestation as well. Um, really importantly, why are we doing the CTG? We only do it on women that have risk factors, so important we don't forget those risk factors and we take it into account when we're deciding action. It may be that our reason for doing it means that we should act a bit quicker when we have fetal heart rate changes. Thinking of decelerations, our commonest form of deceleration are variable decelerations. Really important that you look at the frequency of the decelerations. If they're with more than 50% of contractions, then that may be increasing risk of hypoxia and also the length of time they've been occurring. Um, the picture here shows V-shaped variables and we would say that there's no concerning features in V-shaped variables. And here we can see there's some non-V-shaped variable decelerations. So you can see straight away that these are a lot more worrying and all of the features around the deceleration are also concerning. Another form of deceleration is late decelerations. These are rare. 
However, when they occur, they are serious. Um, they are called late decelerations because they occur as the contraction is going off and recover after the contraction has finished. Um, and if they're with more than 50% of the contractions, then there's a serious risk of hypoxia. Okay, so thinking of our categories of our CTG, if we have a CTG that's categorized as suspicious, um, I guess we could say this is um, where we might be able to reverse things and maybe get back to um, a normal CTG. So it's your, your period of time where you may be able to do something to improve things. Um, clearly, even with a suspicious CTG, you need to consider your antenatal risk factors, you need to look at the presence of any new intrapartum risk factors, and you need to assess the progress in labour. Because even though you might say, well, it's just suspicious, if you have any of these risk factors that might mean that the foetus is not going to cope so well in labour, you may want to act earlier. Okay, if your CTG is classified as pathological, Okay, then the recommendation there is if possible, you would do a fetal blood sample. Um, of course, you've got to consider the antenatal risk factors, the presence of any new intrapartum risk factors and progress in labour to decide whether that's appropriate or whether you need to just expedite birth. But there certainly needs an action plan and escalation. Fetal scalp stimulation is something recommended by Figo and NICE um, and this is where the fetal scalp is stimulated during a, a vaginal examination and you're seeing if the fetal fetus responds and the fetal heart rate goes back to normal. You're not just looking for an acceleration, you're looking for a normalisation of the CTG as well. And if that doesn't occur, you can't be reassured by that test. Um, there is some discussion whether fetal blood sampling is actually... Um, um, an effective thing to do. Uh, certainly there's been a Cochrane review that concluded that an FBS in addition to a CTG can provide additional information on foetal wellbeing and can reduce the risk of operative birth. Um, if you have a foetal blood sampling sticker that you use in your unit then be familiar with that. Um, this is an example and it's documenting that you can also uh, um, not only document the rate, but you can actually stick the printouts there as well if you have paper printouts just to make sure they're um, secure. Okay, so we've had a, a whistle stop through um, CTG's electronic fetal monitoring, hopefully emphasizing that it's not just the fetal heart rate we're looking at, it's the context and it's changes that have happened in labor and it's also your antenatal risk factors. But just to re-emphasize the commonest cause of a pathological CTG is too many contractions. So monitor the contractions and if you think they're more than four in ten then you want to do something about reducing those. Okay, information sources. Um, everything we've um, used here has come from the NICE guidance or the FIGO guidance. We've obviously reported back on the EMBRACE reports and the most recent publications. As I said, there's also information in the prompt course manual. Um, if you look at your supplementary booklet, you'll see that we've listed these information sources there as well. Thank you.